what's up youtube hello first time long time i know i was gonna say this is a... Show, showing my face on here dude how how's it feel uh it feels like the same it feels like just what my, everyone's life is in my existence <laughs> we're on a fucking zoom call it's just you know it's hack at this point to even comment on it <laughs> so what's up with zoom anyway <laughs> so awkward people talk over each other uh, how's everyone doing i'm glad to start uh get that fucker paul out of here and start our own enterprise secret get out of here episode zero episode the mocking zero. the mocking minisodes yes this is a new series where matt and i are going to work through some of the so we we did an episode early on right it was like our second or third episode i think yeah on mm-hmm. uh, a pair of arthur mockin who was a welsh our author like sort here's, of here's i mean it's in the thumbnail yeah, you, but here's you, my here's my cooler copy my dope copy yeah. look at that nice that oxford is, oxford press i think we have the same edition you just have the like because mine's the oxford too you yours is just the fancy hardcover version yeah, mine's cloth bound in a nice king of yellow, but you know, sort of mustard. It's a little, I'm not gonna lie, it's a little whoops, whatever. Maybe this is just because it's a British designer or something, whoever did the cover, but it's it is a little don't tread on me. It's the yellow and the snake. That's true. <laughs> but they hate that. No, I know. The Brits. They love being trod on. Also, you know, all disrespect, the British usually do a bad job um with graphic design. <laughs> And so I'm just, you know, mildly pleased with the the feel of this uh, as like an art object. That's, yeah. Is that true? Do they have a reputation for bad graphic design? That's interesting. I don't know. I'm just, okay. You know, I'm just trying to start something. I think you, <laughs> usually when I see like the, the British edition of something, I'm like, no, I think we, you know, I prefer to, I prefer American. Yeah. <laughs> buy, Ameri- buy American, dude. Buy American, dude. So this is a, this is a. A first for spinecrackers related content where we've done brunch like vaguely brunch episodes before but this is a real real deal 7 a.m waking up with the spinecrackers it's a job officially <laughs> <laughs> yes speaking of which we are officially professionals at this because we have a patreon which yeah if you enjoy this, you can go to, I'll put it, it's in the, you have to do this. And you say the description box as if That's people right. don't know where it is. Um, <laughs> Help. I'm in the, I'm in the computer. <laughs> it's like that episode of, are you afraid of the dark when the guy winds up in the pinball machine? Right. Yeah. I always <laughs> wanted that to happen to me. I was like, that seems awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> You agree. <laughs> I agree. I do agree. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, check out the Patreon. Check out the you are checking out the YouTube currently. So subscribe mm-hmm. and like the video. Please tell your, your friends about tell it. all your friends, all of your all those mocking heads out there. Yeah. And uh leave a comment. That's we love comments. I was um, yes, that's actually true. It's way more fun than even likes, mm-hmm. even though although I don't know which one bubbles you up better. I think it's likes because yeah, it's a more it's, like no, it's a more like yeah exactly right numerical um but uh i was watching i did like minor i didn't do basically any research i never really do but uh chad uh, chad energy my, <laughs> minor like i, I watched uh I, I was suggested a random clip of some professor talking about weird fiction uh it wasn't a very it was an okay thing it was an okay class. He was one yeah. of these guys who it, he looked exactly like the kind of guy who would be teaching a weird fiction course <laughs> in like a, a state school or whatever. No disrespect, but like, wow, dude, I'm, yeah. I'm offended. Uh, you know, like comic book guy from the Simpsons looking dude, yes, big, yes. tight, pulled back ponytail and uh, <laughs> clearly wanted to get to Lovecraft and had to cover Machin. Um, but I, you know, there's some interesting stuff there, um, uh, about like, you know, cause Machin, right. And I don't know if we're even saying that, right. I don't know if we've ever confirmed. How does, how does this guy say it? I forget. Oh, okay. We're going to say Machin. What else could so it be? Like just gird Ma- yourself. Machin? That M- M- Machin? I don't know. Machin? Machin? Mosh, maybe shush, mosh. 
I mean, that's what the, w- Welsh has more of that, like, shoo, 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 shoo. yeah, that's true. Maybe so. Maybe it's moshing. Uh, but we'll say mocking. Fuck yeah. it. Um, I like it better. It's yeah, um, me too. It sounds better to me. Sounds like Mach Five. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was just some cool. There was cool stuff like uh, just about the the time period and and things. Mm. You know, as always, like turn of the century was really just fascinating anyway and all of these like uh weird because paul i think mentioned that he was in a magic club or something with uh bram yeah, stoker right and uh you know and, and and it's mentioned in the end notes of this story but like he was in something called the hermetic order of the golden dawn yep um which i'm pretty sure is actually also uh uh like a, a cult organization from skyrim is that right hold on let me make sure <laughs> uh it's got some mythic dawn sorry oh okay it's still fun i think it still exists uh Mm. although in a kind of um deteriorated form but there was some like cool let me read some of these these folks that were in here you had bram stoker Mm -hmm. uh you had william butler yates uh mockin of course you had sir arthur conan doyle Uh, that's interesting you had alistair crowley shocker uh yeah and then some other people that are more like actresses and and stuff of the time um and politicians and things but they would have been like the edgy the like olsen twins of the of the late 1800s dude where are the olsen twins Uh, well they're probably in some occult society The yes, the people like the when he was talking about the like emaciated woman at the window, I was yeah. like in my mind, I was like very an Olsen twin probably. It really, <gasps> it's like sunken eyed. Yeah, that was a creepy description. We'll get to um, it. but yeah, I don't I don't know what the you know, so so the, I think that's what Paul meant by Magic Club, like mm. this this occult order, uh, and there was some other stuff popping off around the same time too, I believe. Like I think uh, he meant that he, there was they were playing Magic the Gathering. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah. Uh but yeah, yeah I, interesting period for sure. Cuz you had you had I think you had the Theosophical Society. Is that Blo- mentioned? That's mentioned in here or was that mentioned in another book that we read recently? I think that's more I think Arthur Miller maybe around his time. I mean, I Blavatsky was operating, I think, around the time more in, in Machen's era. Yeah. But the Theosophical Society is another one of these things that uh, exists and is still relatively, I don't know, popular. You know, it um, might have been mentioned in the um, the Three Imposters, which is another one that we will be doing eventually. Oh, for yeah. This I haven't series. gotten through that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could just be mixing it up, but I'm pretty sure... Machen mentions it at some point um, in some one of these stories, but you know these these have links to obviously like Mace, Mace, the Masons, and then uh, there's a funny little end note here about the Rosicrucians mm-hmm. on in Machen's own uh, experience. Uh, yeah, all these all these kind of like hierarchical occult societies trying to, you know, I don't know, attain the Godhead or, or access the you know pierce the veil and access the other realm and all that stuff's obviously like the content of these stories for the most part as far as the ones i've read and like you can go check out our discussion on the great god pan which i believe this was supposed to be rolled into is that right okay he saw it as of a piece i I don't know i maybe it was changed at the end when it was like going to be a standalone but yeah i think there was something about it this book, the inmost light, or this story, the inmost light, being uh, part of the overall mythos of the great god Pan. And you know, one of the things that I was getting that I really enjoyed reading this is that you start to see, and I have already, I did already read the Three Imposters, so I saw a little bit more of it in that as well. But you start to see Machin, like, you know, it's it's cringe at this point in in media to use the phrase like cinematic universe or whatever yeah but, but like Machin, there's an eu there's an eu for mocking the mocking verse is real and it's british gentlemen yeah it's british it's like british kind of it's like sort of like yeah like turn of the century british x-files almost <laughs> yeah right? yeah Where, which like, is a cool ass description yeah 
um just fucking you know sojourners and psychonauts <laughs> yeah you know exactly and you know the the character the one of the main characters there's really two in this one there's salisbury who is sort of a ancillary character but then there's dyson who yeah. really does the main like sort of paranormal investigating as it were well and salisbury he, is like the straight man right yeah exactly um salisbury's kind of like the skeptic sort of scully you know, scullisbury exactly <laughs> yeah and dyson is the the uh molder um and he 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 is a recurring character he comes back in um uh the three imposters and i think he's in uh one of the other ones too at some point or he's mentioned he seems very likely a Machin insert of sorts. Yes. Because he's I, a writer who's unappreciated, underappreciated. And yeah. So he starts out the story doing basically like basically like crime journalism, right? That's kind of sort of his like current. Yeah. Yeah. He he has a quote here, which I thought was funny, like pretty early on, which I think is basically, you know, just a description of Machin's own plight here, slash philosophy. Um where, you know, the they're sort of talking about like crime and how like he's 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 bemoaning the fact that uh people just want all of this like crass violence and blood and guts and how it's not sophisticated and how he would love no, no jump scare a24 kino if he could probably watch it <laughs> <laughs> but you know he, he makes a point here uh which is his uh he's responding to salisbury and he's like, well, in plain language, we have no good writers in London who make a, a specialty of that kind of thing. Our common reporter is a dull dog. Every story that he has to tell is spoilt in the telling. His idea of horror and of what excites horror is so lamentably deficient. Nothing will content the fellow but blood, vulgar red blood. And when he can get it, he lays it on thick and considers that he has produced a telling article. It's a poor notion. And by some curious fatality, it is the most commonplace and brutal murders which always attract the most attention and get written up the most. Um, I dare say you, all the true crime podcasts out there. A hundred percent that you all gobble up. Uh, for instance, I dare say you never heard of the Harlesden case, which, you know, then launches the, the story proper. So what w- what is the Harlesden case? Uh, Harlesden is like this this sort of like town or a new exurb i guess of london mm-hmm. there's something there's something here about like literally suburban sprawl no I, I i was reading something about that it may have been in the in the introduction to this book which i haven't read in full but i've kind of skipped around because it's kind of long yeah I, I read something to that effect too that part of what Machin was working with here was like some some sense of you know urban <laughs> like like yeah, sprawl and blight and kind of like right. London London as a city losing its character. Because a big part of this story is like Machin lovingly describing various sort of parts of, of London as the city and sort yeah. of hating the, the the suburban expansion. You think of like a, a time lapse of like a slime mold growing. Like, I feel like that's what he regards suburban sprawl, which, you know fair enough on some level right yeah, it gets oh yeah. as you get to the edges there is a sort of you know you know uniformity i guess lack of care i mean this is shit that we still have gripes with and still happens Absolutely. um i thought it also had something to do you know in in Machen's case spooky Machen, because uh he maybe believes in like um shit what is it called uh fuck not like ley lines and stuff, but like, uh, why can't I remember? Psychogeography or whatever, yeah, like the yeah. proto proto version of psychogeography or whatever right. it's called. Um, and just like a, a place having power and and losing it or having it diverted and and perverted through a lack of like people respecting sacred geometry and like you know that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I must have thought some of that. Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah, and there's, you know, there's that description of, so so basically the plot of the story is, and, and it's interesting because it's kind of broken up in, one of the things that Machen does pretty regularly is like, he tells big chunks of his stories as stories within stories, either as yeah. like stories being related from one character to another, 
or right. in the form of letters or things like that. And that is that is certainly the case here, like because it basically opens with Dyson telling Salisbury about this weird, you know, sort of disappearance, essentially, of a woman, yeah. a, a doctor's wife in this suburb, Harlesden. Um, and uh, he kind of goes to investigate and it gets a little weird. And then Salisbury gets involved and it gets a little weirder. Yes, it's it's the the pacing is also, you know, uh formulaic i would say in a good way uh, and i would say you know since he since Machen is supposed to be you know big daddy progenitor of the kind of standards of, of weird fiction right it it was fairly new um i think in the great god pan we we mentioned you know like the epistolary stuff that's that's what bram soaker was also doing and that was like i think uh at the time a way to like create a a sense of realism mm-hmm because everyone knows like it's like oh no it's it's not a book it's, it's a letters. collection of letters yeah well because that was wasn't it was it, it, it was it the great god pan or the white people that at one point was i think it was great god pan right like it, yeah it yeah. Sort of got this reputation in its time of being sort of like you know yeah. is it true is it really it was like the blair original blair witch project like is it is yeah it people real freaked out is it fake they thought it was real yeah people freaked out and were like uh and Machin was pretty pretty badly like criticized and slandered and just considered a, a degenerate <laughs> the word the keyword that ever always pops up uh classic and he was you know regarded as part of the decadence movement which i still am not i should have looked that into that a little more i'm, I'm not cl- like totally clear on what the decadence movement was he, so is. he was Machen was associated with that that's interesting yeah he was he was called a decadence writer i don't <laughs> I mean, I, it's just good. Maybe because he's just like into spooky stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe he was seen as a sign of degeneration of, at some point. Well, he's an interesting figure because he's like, you know, he was like pretty conservative. Like mm-hmm. c- clearly like there's things he's like, do not tread on this. Do not like go there. Like we, let's keep things nice. And, so, you know, like let's keep society nice, blah, blah, blah. But he's also like highly critical of, I think we, you know, we said before, like materialism and rationalism and these things creating, you know, uh, conceptual prisons that keep yep. us from 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 recognizing like the what he believed was like the legitimate threat of like uh, unknown otherworldly parallel universes and, and, and spiritual entities and stuff. And that's where his conservative conservatism kicked in where he was like he was in these occult orders i think so he would know his enemy or something and right. like but but also know how to harness the good and well because yeah. yeah he definitely i mean then that that's sort of one of the themes in, in this story because you know essentially the spoilers i guess but essentially the the big reveal is that so basically it was this woman mrs black who sort of went disappeared this doctor's wife and yeah. Dyson, Dyson thinks he may have seen her at, in sort of spectral zombie form <laughs> yeah. in in a in a, a window of the home when he goes to investigate. Um, His description of seeing her is so funny because he's like, "I was going for my morning, you know, my ramble, my morning constitutional." <laughs> and then, like, when he like describes it, like a woman pop, it, <laughs> he was like, "His description was funny to think of in reality." Yes. Where he's like, my breath came in ga- breaths came in gasps, and I almost snapped my walking stick in half, clutched in my white knuckled hands, and I'm like, that would look so ludicrous. Like, <laughs> yeah, here I I actually have it that uh, I think is is um, it's worth reading. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. I love how these people are afraid in these books. Oh, they're so, yeah, these stories so genuinely it's terrifying. Like, oh, yeah. Um, while I was getting out my pouch, I looked up in the direction of the houses, and as I looked, I felt my breath caught back and my teeth began to chatter, and the stick I had in one hand snapped in two with the grip I gave it. It was as if I had an electric current down my spine, and yet for some moment of time, which seemed long, but which must have been very short, I caught myself wondering what on earth was the matter. Then I knew what had made my heart shudder and my bones grind together in agony. As I glanced up, I had, I had looked straight towards the last house in the row before me, and in an upper window of that house, I had seen for some short fraction of a second a face. It was the face of a woman, and yet it was not human. You and I, Salisbury, have in our time, as we sat in our seats in church in sober English fashion, of a lust that cannot be satiated and of a fire that is unquenchable. But few of us have any notion what these words mean. 
I hope you never may, for as I saw that face at the window with the blue sky above me and the warm air playing in gusts about me, I knew I had looked into another world, looked through the window of a commonplace brand new house and seen hell open before me. <laughs> like, it's kind of goofy, but it's good. Yeah, I really like it. Uh, it's, you know, it's a fear. It, it, it's the conservative fear sort of like things are are uh, developing in a certain direction too fast and it's not good yes which is not you know not always always unfounded i'm not always like against that stuff right you know because around this time you have also more so in maybe america but like the populist movement mm. occurring and this kind of like i don't know i'm 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 out of my depth here but like just a, maybe just some sort of general shift of the, the uh, understanding about like yeah pr progress i guess like mm -hmm. where what that means and what wh what's happening and you know the the majority of people be coming online about that for for the first time like kind of overtly although Machen represents the you know upper crust more than anything i think yeah i think that's fair Machen is much i don't you know was more uh, uh from the that sort of background and had that kind of angle yeah um so you know, I, I thought that the rest of the story was, I, I mean, I think one of the ways in which kind of science, one of the things that Machen likes to do is have, you know, men of science sort of confronted mm -hmm. with that, like, there are more things on heaven and earth <laughs> moment. Yeah, yes. Um, and that happens a couple times in this story, because, you know, uh, Dyson ultimately winds up. So first of all, Salisbury, is taking a walk and gets lost in London and it's sort of creepy. It's very like eerie and atmospheric, the description. Yeah. And he gets caught in a rainstorm and this drunk couple walks by and they drop this piece of paper with this really strange, like cryptic, like seemingly nonsense message on it. Yeah. Um, which he winds up giving to Dyson. I want to read it. I want to find it. Yeah, yeah, if you can find it. And so Dyson sort of sets about trying to decode this message and, and what it means. Um, but in the meantime, he goes to speak to uh, essentially the coroner who looked at the body of Mrs. Black. Uh, and, you know, he pronounced, I forget what they pronounced it originally, the cause of death, but Dyson gets to picking his brain a little bit. And the guy, you know, who's this man of science doctor basically is like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what, I didn't know what to make of it. It was, <laughs> it wasn't the brain of a human. It was the, it was the brain of a devil uh and right it, it's like you know this sort of like demon brain that this doctor <laughs> can't figure out yeah it had like gross it like had extra stuff on it mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it, it's kind of creepy and gross uh yeah i remember yeah he's like you know the cause of death you know keep us on the down low but the cause of death i think was was murder dun, dun, and initially dun. you're like oh dr black he's he he's evil mm -hmm. and then but then the doctor's like and i think it was i think it was the correct thing to do because yes. I looked at the brain and it had like weird ridges on it and it had like extra parts <laughs> and i mean we talked about this in the great god pan as well and this might be the link is like because we were talking about pineal gland stuff and like how that was also you know like you said the, the seat that, of the soul and thing yeah that was the thing since descartes if not before i mean before really yeah but Descartes was particularly obsessed with it. So like you, there is this kind of thing where like if you see. It's more if you look upon gaze upon the face or whatever of of the great God Pan as as. A instantiation, like maybe simplified of just like the sort of generative chaos underneath the ordered reality that we we all see. Uh, your mind is it doesn't get blown it gets like restructured but then i guess you just turn right. into like and then you just want to fucking die I, I don't i don't know really know what happens after that you're so <laughs> shook that like right. you just you become a big zombie weirdo yep uh or die of fright or whatever or or in or you get impregnated with the demon spawn Yes, you get impregnated or so it seems like it also maybe like sucks your life force out of you. Mm -hmm. Like it, it just takes from you. And that's why you get like sort of vampirically drained and you look all old when you're not. Well, so that's sort of a spoiler for how this book ends up. Here's the rhyme. I don't know why I want to read it. No, it's, it's good. But it's just uh, once around the grass and twice around the lass and thrice around the maple tree. 
I don't know. Maybe and that's, someone else. That was, that's the whole thing, right? That's it. And it's, it seems, and well, isn't there, wasn't there something else on there, like a number or something? I forget what exactly was on the piece of paper. That, I think, that, that might have been it. I think it's just more like a, it ends up being um, is just, just a, is like an address. Like tra- traverse handle S or something. Yeah. Yeah. But it, so, it ends up being just, yeah, like a, an address that uh, once again, uh, Dyson stumbles, stumbles upon sort of yes. accidentally. Um, and it's this kind of weird, like back alley curiosity shop. Yeah. It's like a little, where you buy Mogwai or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like a curio <laughs> shop and, and the the rhyme is just actually just like this sort of like code phrase to gain access to and the guy the guy who owns the shop who has the the item Mm -hmm. which is this which turns out to be this beautiful like shining like like unbelievable jewel um uh, he's very scared you know he doesn't know who dyson is and he refers to dyson uh as mr davies yeah. Which keep that in mind because Mr. Davies is a character, a dark character in the Three Imposters. Ooh, I and, can't wait to read this and, one. And so it uh, it becomes like a again we get the sense of like there's this shadowy organization or something operating uh, in the background here because mm-hmm. the the jewel was originally in possession of the Doctor. That was his like who who had like fallen on squalor and was living like in this poor apartment and Dyson sort of befriends him a little bit before he, he dies. Um, and, but the jewel was stolen from him just before, stolen from him right before he dies. And that's, so the, there, we get this impression that there's some sort of shadow, like dark organization, secret magical society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, exactly. And that's part of the mock inverse because Mr. Davies is a character in other stories. Uh, and so him and Dyson maybe are, are kind of working at odds. Now, do you, do you recall like, because I, I think we should touch on, since it's so short and it's the first story, The Lost Club. Um, is Davies mentioned at all in that? So I was trying to remember, and I think, so the, the two characters in that story are um, who? Phillips, who is a, a recurring character as well. Yeah. Um, Phillips and Dyson kind of become the main two basically the Mulder and Scully, although they're both kind of, they're both kind of Mulders. Yeah. Um, and then I forget who the, the name of the second main character in that one, Williams. Who I think also appears again. Um, um, yeah, but I don't believe Davies is mentioned in that one. Well, There's... maybe he's, he's suggested to be one of the members of the Lost Club. Yes. So yeah, the Lost Club is basically just, it's like a three page, four page story, right? Um, Once again, like some English gentlemen having a nice ramble after some some drinks get caught in the rain. Yes. And seek shelter. And it just happens to be like, you know, they just go into like a eyes wide shut ritual where everyone like what takes turns turning this page of this like weird tome. And then if someone gets a, a page that's completely black or whatever. Yeah. And then they disappear. And they they're, disappear. They are disappeared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe and they're then, killed like, or fed to some ancient god. Yeah, no one really knows. And then the club itself, you know, they go back to confirm and the club is gone and as though it never was. Yes. Uh, and so, so there's we, just that. As a, as a tone setter at the beginning of the collection, we mm-hmm. may, it may be that Davies is an, an, and the shadowy organization is the Lost Club. And yeah. Davies is one of their members, as you say. He's one of the Lost Boys. <laughs> the Lost Boys, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um. I guess the oh the other cultural like thing like when did the Rosetta Stone um, make its way? Like when was it discovered? To the yeah, uh, I don't know. I want to because say... there's also the Egyptology angle, uh, which I think the Lost Club suggests potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, it was disco- it was disco- so it was discovered in 1799. So this, it was okay. certainly around. Like people certainly knew about it by the time. Mock and I, I we we might still I think we were still trying to I don't when did we fucking crack the code on that sorry Gabe you're gonna no be, it's that's a no it's a good question let's see so Jamie why don't you pull that up because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's another thing that like well to do people like you know this was in America too uh, all the like big magnates you know trying to crack Egyptian hieroglyphics so that you know and potentially be the get the secret knowledge to be gods themselves and be yeah. like 
put in the modern equivalent of pyramids and stuff. That's why you see all the Art Deco modernist stuff in New York City. It has like weird, uh, totally ibises and fucking yeah, like pyramids and stuff on it. So I'm not, I can't get a, a totally straight answer, but it looks like some major progress was made in the 1820s. So that would have been before Bakken's time as well. Right. Interesting. You know. So yeah, I'll, I'll, it's Machen is just in that fucking occult, like he's simmering just in it, dude. soups, like just so deep, marinating, mm-hmm. letting the flavors all seep in. Um. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It is funny because it does feel a little bit like it seems like finally the awareness of, uh, like other cultures and their sort of religious and mystical practices was finally just sort of like accepted but as like a fringe weird hobby right by mostly people with a lot of leisure time which were the rich yes who were like maybe you know and it's just you know it's got that pseudo racist element to it where it's like ancient chinese medicine oh, you know yeah, like totally maybe maybe they know how i could live forever you know which is which like which has really not gone anywhere. <laughs> no. It's still like pretty, pretty. Uh, that's kind of how the West treats a lot of that stuff. Like, you know, just like Western. I mean, uh, this, I could go on about this stuff for but like, you know, Western yoga and Western Buddhism and what, like right. all that stuff, you know. Um, if anything, it's, it's, it seems worse to me than it was then. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, really. And it, it, and it, and it also is maintained, as you say, its status as like a, sort of curiosity for the rich to pursue in their leisure time right and then repackaged as like a luxury uh you know pyramid scheme or whatever where it's like no you know you, right. you need to access the mystical uh top orders you need to pay your way through the lower <laughs> yeah. the lower mysteries or whatever. Yeah. it's always a mystery it's always a fucking secret <laughs> there's so many mysteries to, to be unlocked <laughs> to, to unlock with the, just the right amount of money um so in the end, in this story, basically what had happened, well, see, what had happened was. What happened? What happened <laughs> was the doctor had, and because Dyson finds a letter from the doctor after his death, right? Right. Dr. Classic. Black. Yeah. And it sort of, you know, puts it all out there. Basically what had happened was the doctor had been exploring some of these occult practices and had done a very he was a fan dangerous kind of experiment on his wife um which these poor women fucked up yeah these poor women are always getting experimented on yeah i don't (laughs) and she's like well she's basically like well okay you can do it but you have to kill me after it's just like jesus yo that's a ride or die bitch (laughs) (laughs) ride and die yes um literally and so, you know, basically, essentially what it, what it, the experiment was, and for some reasons we don't understand, he, it was, it had already gone too far and he couldn't go back, blah, 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 whatever. But yeah, he sucked her soul out and it was replaced by a demon soul, basically. Uh, and he, marriage, he, am I right? <laughs> the freaking <laughs> ring. <laughs> it, well, and it is, it is because her soul was in the stone that that Dyson well, finds was it hers though well that was my impression partially or was her was her you know primordial life essence siphoned off from her but the thing in the stone was not human or was like part of that um weird primordial creative force like entombed in the crystal that's an interesting question cuz one of the I guess the reason that I kind of thought uh, about like um, that I thought it was her, her or her soul was a, just the title of the story, like the, the inmost light referring both to the, the stone and mm-hmm. also to kind of like the thing within us, the, the spark of life, the right. You know, yeah. Whatever. Um, Bear, you're right. Yeah. And, and sort of just the, his description of it at the end, because ultimately Dyson is horrified realizing what this stone is and crushes it. Um, and um, the, the description of what happens is like, you know, it's this like little white coil of some something uh, rising mm-hmm. upward, which I sort of interpreted as her kind of going to heaven or whatever, her soul finally being freed. Let's say that's the happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> that's like the good ending. Yeah. 
And the dark ending is that he he accidentally has just released something terrible into the world. <laughs> terrible that's just going to go devour everyone it can get its hands on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because, you know, again, I, I, this connection to the great god Pan as this being... I mean, we've been su suggesting the, the whole time, too, that, like, yeah, there's basically the city of London and all these recurring characters, like, tying in. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a kind of, like, overarching story within the world that he's trying to get across like definitely you know it's like in sin city when you know you see all the characters from the movies in the one bar and you're like oh it's all they all live in sin city <laughs> oh, <so. laughs> uh but you know what i mean like another i think like the epistolary approach like another i think somewhat new grounding technique or something like you know, th these characters are walking in and out of each other's lives. Like, this is a connected world. Right. You and, know. Well, at, at one point in this story, uh, is it in this story? Yeah, I think so, right? Or that might be in The Three Imposters. I forget. But... It's tough, but that's the point. They all believe yeah, in Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. He, does he... He doesn't. That's in The Three Imposters. Yeah, it's, yeah. this is pretty self-contained. There's just yeah. the, like couple characters i thought there might have been one more reference to davies but that's in under the other story can't wait to meet this guy yeah 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 he's he's a bad dude yeah um but yeah it's it's i, I think you're right that in terms of doing the sort of like eu thing <laughs> Machin was kind of pioneering uh yeah you know obviously you know you had i mean i don't know you had writers who wrote of like who, who wrote multiple stories or things about like one fictional city or had like a setting that they like to work in or whatever. But yeah. Um, yeah. I think in that, that sort of interweaving of, of characters and yeah, as you say, them kind of just popping up in various contexts and places, it does feel a little different. Yeah. Cause. And yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to see how, I, I think he works the same ground. I mean, we have a particular collection. I don't know how much Machen had has written entirely mm -hmm. so i think you know we have a collection that is thematically bound and yeah. and whatever but um yeah the, the the whole point is is these forces and they, they they emerge in different forms but it is it seems to me they are all of a piece in the sense that there's like <laughs> just chaos, like weird spooky chaos underneath everything we've 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 achieved some level of, of order, but it is illusory. Uh, and he's just kind of like, never forget it. Right. You know, like, and it's always, it's always this sort of, right. It's never, it's never explicit really. Right. Like what is happening? It's always that layer of kind of, like you said, holds it right to the and, end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when you, even as you like it, with the ambigu ambiguity in the ending, we know like the sequence of events that happens ultimately, but we don't really know what happened if that makes sense right and that's the weird element you know because yeah. that that's kind of like the thing that is a that was a criticism of mock and himself's writing style back then which is has now become just the staple of weird fiction which is describing a negative and like mm -hmm. and like uh you know saying something is what it by what it's not and this kind of thing and everyone being and you know all the british critics being like Seems like Mocking himself doesn't know what he he means. And, Be you know, direct, good sir. Yes, it's just filth and <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> I, there's a I, I highlighted a, a good uh, a passage that I thought kind of captured a lot of this. This is sure. this is when um, Dyson is kind of befriending Doctor Black, who has fallen into squalor and poverty. Right, um, and he almost a Dickensian description of like squalor. Yes. He lives in this, like, he's always constantly laid on his rent and lives in this little, like, back apartment in someone's building, like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so this is, he's talking about discussing, um, you know, the doctor's kind of theories and stuff. I suggested that something he had said was in flat contradiction to all science and all experience. No, Dyson, he answered, not all experience, for mine counts for something, which, by the way, I thought was a great line. I love that line. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am no dealer in unproved theories. What I say, I have proved for myself and at terrible cost. There is a region of knowledge of which you will never know, which wise men seeing from afar off shun like the plague as well they may, but into that region I have gone. If you knew that you could even dream of what may be done, 
of what one or two men have done in this quiet world of ours, your very mm. soul would shudder and faint within you. Maybe Davies. Yeah. What you have heard from me has been but the merest husk of the outer covering of true science, that science which means death, and that which is more awful than death to those who gain it. No, Dyson, when men say that there are strange things in the world, they little know the awe and the terror that dwells always within them and about them. Love it. Yes. So good. And hey, listen, even if it's metaphorically taken, that's true. That's the, that's the, the I fucking love science dark <laughs> undercurrent there is, <laughs> is the monstrosities that we, 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 you know, read on each other with that shit. God. Yeah. I think I, Machen, I think would have, would have been a harsh critic of the IFL science crowd. Dude, yeah, that's literally the opposite of what he wanted anyone to think. <laughs> it's yeah. like, no, yeah. people would have just draw. People would have just yes chatted, memed him. Yeah, exactly. Just like, <laughs> you can't just like science arena. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up, nerd. Shut up, magic nerd. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Any other thought? Any other thoughts? We're we'll, we'll, we're gonna have plenty more time to discuss Machen and Machen's sort of context going forward. But yeah, yeah. I I think and I think on um, you know, I think in particular with this collection, like we will touch on the same stuff over and over again, and hopefully, you know, maybe I'll do a little more research this time. Hopefully, we can. Uh, you did. You sounded like you had plenty. We can just like work it. You know, build it out. That's yeah, gonna evolve organically. Yeah. Um. Thanks creature yeah Meta metastasizing like a, yeah exactly <laughs> maybe <laughs> demon spawn yeah yeah exactly right um so what how do you should we should we we, we mean the, the tradition from the other series is that we give individual story scores mm. do, we, do we want to continue this uh or is that i, I kind of don't That's i kind of don't i kind of like i kind of take this now to be a book like a novel mm. Mm. Um, sort of like the ongoing Marvel storyline. Yes. I mean, I, I'm, it, I love that comparison always in the same way as please God read another book. Yes. Uh, but uh, I will say that I, I like, I just like mocking a lot. I think yeah. we were talking about this, you know, before, but it's like just, just fucking enjoyable, good mm -hmm. stuff, like nice writing right on the cusp of like, it's still like kind of old old school, you know, proper British style, prose style. Um, but very readable though, still. Yeah, and it's the first book I've ever, I've read in a while where the end notes are enjoyable to me. Like the, the end lots notes of cool in this... historical information in the back, like oh, kind of excited always to go back there and like read like cool turns, Latin turns of phrase and old ways they used to naming conventions for like stuff in london in the late 1800s you Absolutely. know it's cool i mean the, you know oxford always does uh a good um a good job with these editions um shout outs oxford world's classics sponsor the show mm, uh please but, um shout out specifically to aaron worth who did the introduction and the notes because the notes on in this are extensive and very detailed and like super illuminating yeah like fun like yeah. you yeah and i guess the only other thing i wanted to say was just um in case anyone's like a rosicrucian uh there's a come very the funny show. there's a very yeah if there's any rosicrucian podcasts come on the show but um i won't i won't read this extensive quote but at the very end you know and i had known this from other sources too but like it's it's a, it's a made up bunch of people were trolling and people took that those troll you know fake letters <laughs> to be real uh so rosicrucian is, da vinci code yeah the order of the rosy cross never existed yep. it was just a, it was just like a fantasy that someone a couple people it made was basically up. like a larp that became real yes yeah basically yeah that's but I guess tight. that's a lot. That's a lot of cults and shit too. So yeah, that's true. <laughs> the line between like is it was it, was it real or not is sometimes blurred. Baudrillard. Baudrillard. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> cool. All well, right, hey, everyone. Thanks for watching this inaugural episode of the Mocking Minisodes. I hope you enjoyed it and come back for later installments. Yes, we, we may do. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do next. We'll see. It's uh. 
Three Imposters is very long. That's like a full. That's a novella. That's a full book. Yeah. So we may do some shorter ones before we tackle that. But uh, either way, it's going to be fun. And, and you, you got a cheeky little The Lost Club in there. Oh, we talked about The Lost Club. Yeah, this was basically a double. That's a story. Yeah. So, I mean, we, I mean, I couldn't say much more about it than we did. <laughs> it's literally three pages. Yeah. It's, just a, it's just a spooky little three page. Yeah. Like, yeah. So we're going to call, we're going to call this a double episode. Yeah. Fuck um, it. Yeah. Double mini Uh So Triple if you double. like it, you know, you know what to do. Like it. Like it. If you liked it, <laughs> like it. <laughs> Do it in the computer. Do it on. Do it. Do it. Formally. Look at what's. Look at what's behind me. I'm measuring all the engagements and metadata that's going on. <laughs> <laughs> these are our. These are our fans behind me. This is all their information. Exactly. We 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 see you and we love you. And we're in love with you. Okay, guys. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>